Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Last week on the National Parks Travelers podcast, we talked with Yellowstone National Park Superintendent Cam Sholley about the state of his park. Part of that conversation touched on crowding and congestion, a problem a number of parks have been dealing with in recent years. It's a good problem in that more and more people want to see these amazing places, but it's not without its impacts on park resources. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. National parks are not alone in grappling with crowds. Many gateway communities surrounding our national parks are notable for their own amazing offerings, natural beauty with tranquil spots for solitude and reflection, and nice venues for dining, listening to live music, and pursuing year-round outdoor recreational and leisure activities. But when the management of visitation in these areas is unchecked, and the very resources that make these places highly desirable destinations are strained, can anything really be done? The community of Jackson, Wyoming, hopes so, recognizing that residents, business owners, and visitors all share in the responsibility of preserving the area's unique character and allure, Stakeholders throughout Teton County have put together a comprehensive sustainable destination management plan. The goal is to protect the beauty of the area, preserve a healthy environment, and, at the same time, enhance the visitor experience, business growth, and the quality of life for area residents. This week, the Traveler's Lynn Riddick talks with Krista Valentino of the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board to find out what's in the plan and how it will help. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. Jackson Hole, Wyoming is the gateway to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. But these aren't the only recreational destinations here. There are plenty of other scenic locales in the valley to keep you entertained with skiing, rafting, fishing, hiking, dining, art and music festivals in and around the quaint town of Jackson and some smaller communities like Wilson, Moose and Teton Village. With an ever increasing number of visitors to Jackson Hole, how do you protect the environment and the long-term prosperity of the community while at the same time establishing a positive, balanced experience for residents and visitors. The Teton County Sustainable Destination Management Plan has some answers. And with me today is Krista Valentino, Executive Director of the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board, and she's going to tell us all about the plan, who's involved, what's in it, and how it will unfold. Hi, Krista. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi, Lynn. Thanks. Happy to be here. First of all, let me ask you, the town of Jackson is often mistakenly referred to as Jackson Hole. So would you clarify for us the difference between Jackson Hole and the town of Jackson? Sure. So as you said, there is the town of Jackson. And then Jackson Hole encompasses more of the whole valley. So um, anyone who ever visits here uh, to get a visual, you have the Teton Range, which runs north to south. Um, on the the western side of Jackson Hole, and then you have the Grovants on the on the eastern side that run also north south. North of us, you have the Absarokas. South, you have the Snake River Valley, and so Jackson Hole is literally this valley between these mountains. And so when people refer to Jackson Hole, they're more 
referring to the region of it. That includes those towns that you mentioned, like Wilson, Moose, Teton Village, Kelly, etc. Well, what is the population of Jackson and I guess the greater Jackson Valley? So Teton County may be the easiest way to describe this. And Teton County encompasses Jackson, Jackson Hole, those other um, towns that I uh, mentioned, as well as it goes all the way up to West Yellowstone. So where Old Faithful is. And it's, you know, about 10 years ago, we had around 10,000 full-time residents. Um, in the, the newer census data, we're looking at about 20,000 full-time residents. That being said, it's sometimes really difficult to really quantify that because we have a lot of transient residents. We have people who come for maybe just the summer and then leave for the winter. We also, in our high seasons, like in the summer and the winter, we have people who come just to work. So on J-1 visas or or may come out just for the summer to work in Grand Teton National Park. So those population numbers go up significantly, where then when you look at the off season, they go down significantly. So really putting your finger on a specific number is actually quite difficult to do. So what are the busiest seasons then? Uh, I would, I think summer and winter are, are of course our busiest seasons. In 2021, Teton County welcomed about 1.6 million overnight visitors. And what we're seeing, if you you base the data off of, say, plane encampments or inbound passengers, we're seeing about a a 50-50 split between summer and winter. In the past, summer has always been a really big draw, but especially when we have big snow years, and especially if other, other destinations don't have very much snow, we're seeing a big increase in visitors in the winter as well. Right. You're home to three ski resorts. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. So we have Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, Snow King Mountain Resort, and then Targhee Mountain Resort. Give us a little background on the unique issues of visitation to the area. When did it start feeling that maybe tourism was getting a little unmanageable? And I use that word cautiously. Yeah. Um, to put a specific um, date or time on it is probably pretty difficult. Um, I will say, so the state of Wyoming has a lodging tax that was established 11 years ago, or sorry, in 2011, so 13 years ago. And that lodging tax is a is an additional tax that is uh, put on to room nights that visitors pay as a part of their stay, and then goes back to the county to pay for the ongoing marketing and promotion of that county. Um, in the past, it was something that was voted in by, uh, by, by community voters, residents every three years. Just recently, the, it, it changed over to being a statewide lodging tax, so it doesn't have to be voted in. But I say that because the purpose of it was really to support and promote travel and tourism to the county. And um, a really common adage that people would use is looking at the heads and beds model. How do we get more people to the county, to the community spending money? And for all intents and purposes, it worked. And so from 2011, for the subsequent five, seven years, we saw a huge increase in tourism numbers and the number of people coming to the valley. And I think it was, so I joined the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board in 2018. And when I just joined the board, there was the start of conversations on the board on the importance of expanding our scope to not only including just promotion and and marketing strategy, but how do we talk about education? How do we adjust our messaging in order to encourage the type of visitor we want to visit or we want to have visit here and how they how they act while they are here and also start thinking about management. And so that was back in 2018 because we really were starting to see those effects of increased tourism. And it wasn't necessarily that was unmanaged or or um, negatively impactful. But when you begin increasing the number of people in a certain area, you sort of get that balloon effect, right? You begin seeing seeing some of the cracks of where your infrastructure maybe is lacking or some of the services that 
we're being able to serve a thousand people are really struggling trying to serve 5,000 or 10,000 people. And so we started seeing that on our roadways, feeling traffic um, in our, our small businesses. So whether that was like restaurants, even at our, our hospitals or our search and rescue operations, things like that. And then COVID hit and we had this huge, huge boom of the, the car travelers, right? The drive market. And Wyoming had very few COVID regulations. Actually, in very many areas across the state, there were no mask mandates. And so people and people were really wanting to flock to get to the outdoors for a lot of reasons, for, for a lot of the reasons I think you and I and anyone listening probably understands. And so we saw such an influx of, of vid- visitors. We had our highest number of visitation in 2020 and then again in 2021. And so not only numbers wise, but also economy wise, we had record years, two years in a row, but that also wasn't without its drawbacks, right? It wasn't without its its implications of what having that many people in such a small area with insufficient or unplanned infrastructure systems in place to support them. So, you know, the traffic congestion, maybe overcrowded restaurants, hotels, what were some of the biggest complaints that you were hearing from residents or visitors? Some other things that were coming up, and, and you named two, traffic, um, long wait times. Like it, there, were, there were a couple of years there that even if, especially if you're a resident, you can go out to dinner because you had you had to make a reservation, lines were out the door. Uh, we were also seeing a really big effect on our public lands. And so Grand Teton National Park uh, has designated campsites that you have to reserve. The overflow from that, especially for people who want to camp, is in our national forests. And tell me which national forest? In in Bridger Teton National Forest. Okay. And so in Bridger Teton National Forest, there are designated campsites and areas that are, you know, free and open dispersed camping, but there all are also designated campsites, even though it's very primitive. And we were finding that people were camping outside of those sites. Um, they were staying for large extended periods of time. We were having, you know, trash potentials of wildfires from, from fires being unattended, um, food storage not happening. So we were seeing this effect of people on our lands. And one of the biggest, I think, fears, and it's a complaint that really, I believe, is driven by a fear, was from the residents on the irresponsible visitors and how that irresponsibility affects the places we love so much, so our, our wildlife, our, our, our wild lands, and even how it feels like we were we were seeing many workers here working multiple jobs, people were frustrated because they had to wait or they were having some sort of issue because we didn't have the infrastructure. And then the feedback they were getting, right, was really negative. And so even that human interaction was getting really strained. So I understand the sustainable destination management plan was 18 months in the making. So were these issues that you just mentioned sort of the driving force or the driving series of events that led to its creation? We began this conversation in early 2018, actually, and it was in early 2020, it was actually at our board retreat in January of 2020, that the board had decided to move ahead with developing a sustainable destination management plan. And then COVID happened two months later. So we put that on the shelf and had to focus, refocus our, our energy and prioritize other things, obviously. But in a way, the timing was actually really good because COVID took place and really showed not only the board, but also our community, the importance of going through this very intense, highly time intensive and energy intensive process. And why now was the time to do it? Now was the time to invest the money. Now was the time to invest the the energy into creating something because we saw what happened if we don't have a strategy looking ahead to better manage this. So what's the overarching philosophy behind the plan? The major philosophy really um, went into 
developing our vision of sustainability, which considers the health of our, our community, the health of our economy, and the health of our environment. And so for us, it's it's imperative that those three work holistically together and are in sync and that we can't make decisions on one, right? We can't just look and focus on the importance of tourism as an economy driver without considering how that may affect or impact, say, the health of the environment and vice versa. We can't just focus on protecting and loving and respecting our environment if we don't think about how to best utilize that as a driver for our economy as well. So who partnered up to be part of the planning process? We, um, so it was funded by the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board, but we contracted with George Washington University and their Institute of um, Travel and Tourism and Confluence Sustainability. And so they were our consultants, our contractors. And then we also hired a sustainability coordinator to be our main, basically project manager for the Travel and Tourism Board. How did you lock on to George Washington University? We went through a pretty extensive RFP process. And so we put out this um, call for proposals nationwide and got back some really great proposals. Um, And then the board evaluated them, went through interviews and ended up landing on GW. So the community identified five pillars as the most significant in terms of building and maintaining a happy community and a healthy environment. Can you walk us through those five pillars? Our five pillars are built off of this community vision that we created. And and I should start by saying that through this process, um, it was incredibly heavy on the community engagement. So at every stage, we would go back and hold these community workshops. We would do focus groups, um, workshops. We, We sent out surveys. And every time a new part of the plan was created, we bring people together and get feedback on it. We also had an online forum where we could put it on there, get feedback, get comments back, and then really adjust what the, the content was based on that feedback we got from the community, which for me is really fun when I read through the final SDMP because it does truly feel unique to our community. It sounds and like just our- to back up the SDMP is oh, the, sorry. Yeah. The, is um, the sustainable destination management plan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but I like the abbreviation. <laughs> yeah. It's such a mouthful that we've gotten in. We we have become a bit of alphabet soup when we begin talking about this, just to shorten it down. But yes, the SDMP is the sustainable destination management plan. So within this document, it's quite long. It's about 70, 75 pages. But if you read it, it it truly does feel like it represents the voice of our community. And so these five pillars that you mentioned is based off of this vision that the community made, which is that Teton County is a leader in balancing the needs and aspirations of community members, businesses, and visitors by actively integrating the viability of our tourism economy with regeneration of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and enhancement of quality of life. So again, going back to those three main foundations of of community, economy, and environment. But those pillars are one, our natural environment, two, the quality of the economy and work, three, quality of life, four, quality of visitor experience, and five, the foundations of success. Any representation from Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Parks? Absolutely. So we worked so closely with both parks, recognizing that on both sides, you know, we operate and exist in big part because of the parks. And we they also are able to operate and exist in large parts because of us. And so we had, as a part of our steering committee, um, Chip Jenkins, who is the superintendent of Grand Teton National Park. And he was and continues to be a really core partner in this work and provided consistent feedback in, I think, better than we've ever done it. We've been able to see how the work and the vision of what we're trying to do in Teton County, not only aligns, but complements the work that they're doing, especially in Grand Teton, but also in Yellowstone. And so 
anything that we are producing, especially within the SDMP, is looking at not just, you know, us in a silo here as as like the main downtown community, but also how that trickles over and trickles into our park system. I'm Lynn Riddick speaking with Krista Valentino of the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board, and we'll be back after this short break. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. back now with Krista Valentino. Okay, so the plan um, is very detailed. I read the whole thing and was interested to see that you have eight action plan goals in the plan itself. Can you run us through those goals and maybe some of the priorities? Out of those five pillars I had mentioned earlier, those get broken down, as you said, into eight goals. And these are main targeted areas that we as a community need to focus on in order to be a sustainable destination. So the eight of them are education and communication. And that's really focused on creating a common understanding of shared responsibility amongst residents, amongst um, businesses, and amongst visitors. So really this um, a lot of outreach under that that uh, goal there. Then visitor flow management. And this is actually one area where we are talking with and working really closely with Grand Teton Yellowstone National Parks. Because if you're talking about visitor management flow or visitor flow management, that includes understanding where where our visitors are going and why they are coming to the valley and what they're doing once they're here. And so it's really important for us to work with the parks to integrate their transportation plans or, or knowledge with what we intend to do. Um, then we have workforce recruitment and retention and community housing. And those two areas really specifically look at the tourism workforce. And I think like a lot of destinations and especially the mountain towns, are having challenges keeping their workforce, recruiting workforce, especially when things like housing are so limited or in in so scarce and short supply. And so it's we recognize in this plan that in order to have a viable tourism economy, um, we really it's really important for us to care about the workers and the workforce who are trying to and who do live here. As a place grows, housing gets more and more desirable, more and more in demand, more and more expensive. And then you kind of price your service industry workers um, out of the nearby areas where they work. And so that they have long commutes from, you know, parts outside of town uh, that contribute to the congestion. So that's a very essential part of this program, I would think, for all the stakeholders. Precisely. And what has been interesting is that, and and I'm sure we'll get to this, but part of what this plan is trying to do is 
recognize that tourism integrates itself into a lot of different facets of our community and, and foundational elements of our community. And in the past, there really hasn't been a conversation around things like workforce retention or community housing, because that that almost has been kept to like the government side or, or the nonprofit, right, the, the civil service side. But what we're trying to recognize and to say here is that, no, we do play a player in this and not just the Travel and Tourism Board, but our hospitality partners as well. And so if we want, again, viable and a viable industry and successful businesses, that's really important to make this a priority in your business strategy, in your business plan, and to also be creative as we begin thinking about the ways that we can use our tourism economy to also power some of the support infrastructure for these areas. Okay, well, let's get back to the other components of the plan then. Yeah, so the fifth one um, of the plan is transportation and mobility. Again, looking at, this is a little bit different than visitor flow management. So this is literally looking at like public transportation or mobility hubs and, and offering alternative modes of transportation, whether that's through pathways and bikes, or how do you communicate with people or communicate with visitors of how to have a more uh, carless vacations when they come, right? And so relieving that that strain on our limited infrastructure, because at the end of the day, we are also a county that is 97% public land, so we can't necessarily develop on it. So making more roads or bigger roads doesn't necess- isn't necessarily a solution or the number one solution that we're looking for. So how do we be creative with that? What do you have there um, now in terms of public transportation? So we have something called the the start bus that services a majority of our community. So it brings people from um, around the town of Jackson and then also out to Wilson and out to Teton Village. At this point, it does not service Grand Teton National Park or some of the larger like up north areas. But we also have an incredible pathway system. I th- I don't know the number, but I off the top of my head, I'd say we have maybe three to 500 miles of, of paved pathway trails, and then not to mention like a, a trail system, like a dirt trail system. So being able to communicate to people that there are other options other than driving your car if you want to have an experience when you're here. And the pathways that you mentioned, are they uh, foot traffic, uh, bikes? You know, who would be using a uh, pathway? All of that. Yep. So foot traffic, bikes, we see a lot of people commuting on it, especially in the summer. Um, in the winter, often some of them are groomed. And so you can skate ski or cross country ski. And they, yeah, they're a really great system. And in the summer, actually, you can bike all the way to the north end of Grand Teton National Park. And there's a big loop you can do that's all on almost a pathway. And so um, our local organizations here have done a really great job of creating these really fun and um, pretty comprehensive pathway system to get people around town. Back to the goals of the plan then. Sure. So the next one we have is climate action. And that one looks at enhancing our destinations resilience to climate or changes in the climate and also trying to reduce climate risks. And so a lot of this is also looking or working with local organizations that are doing some of this work already. For instance, we have a a couple organizations who are looking at, you know, alternative fuels for vehicles and who are also specifically looking at like climate change mitigation. So when we're looking at climate action, it's it's recognizing that this is beyond just the impact that you're having on the ground in the moment, whether you're stepping off a trail, for instance, or throwing out like a piece of trash, that actually when you're traveling to a place or how you act when you're there, whether that's what type of transportation you're taking or what you're eating or how you're how far you're driving around, that we're looking at and understanding using to our best of our abilities our reach to educate people about the influences of us as humans on climate change, but also the impacts of say, you know, when if we have a 
low snow year, how that water or that lack of snowfall affects our lakes, our rivers, and how that affects our ecosystems. And so trying to also plan ahead to mitigate those impacts if and when they come. All right, goal number seven. Yeah, goal number seven is marketing and reporting. Looking at data, being able to track data of, of tourism and travel trends in the area year over year. And then also being able to provide that to our community free of cost and so that people can make better decisions for their businesses and their strategies, whether that's marketing or management moving forward. And then the final one is governance. And right now, uh, the way our community is set up is that we do not have a destination management and marketing organization, co commonly called a DMML. We have a Jacksonville Travel and Tourism Board, which is the main marketing organization for the community. Uh, we also have a Chamber of Commerce and we have many other partners, everything from, you know, our park to our airport, which is the only airport in the country that's in a national park. We also have our big partners at Jacksonville Mountain Resort. And so there's, there's a lot of voices and a lot of people and a lot of institutions who are dealing with tourism in the Valley. But we don't have one overarching governance structure who are coordinating them all, facilitating that, and who are looking at marketing and messaging across all of these different, all these different pages. And so one of the main priorities and goals of the SDMP is to set up a governance structure to really maintain this, this vision of creating an all all lands collaborative effort for the community. So I want to talk a little bit more about that um, because the plan's recommendation is the creation of the Teton County Destination Stewardship Council. So that's what you're talking about, this new organization that will manage and implement the, the points of the plan in the short term. So I understand that that council, the formation is already underway. What's the status of that? Yeah. Um, so the Destination Stewardship Council is really this first step towards a larger governance structure. As you can imagine, trying to set up a countywide governance structure with all these different players is going to take some time and facilitation. So in the interim, this Destination Stewardship Council has been formed and they have already met twice and they meet monthly and the, the group continues to strategically grow. But really the purpose of this group is one, to get representatives, a diverse set of stakeholders, tourism-based um, stakeholders from the community as part of the group, to um, collaboratively implement these priorities and actions laid out in the plan. Because what's really important is that the SDMP, although it was funded by the Jacksonville Travel and Tourism Board, is not a Jacksonville Travel and Tourism Board document. And it's really important that we aren't the only ones that are implementing it, that it really does take that all hands approach to its implementation. And so this Destination Stewardship Council, which here's another acronym for you, we've been calling it <laughs> DSC, um, that DSC is really tasked with forwarding or keeping the momentum and forwarding the implementation and the actions of the SDMP. Let me ask you, do you have local environmental groups that have you know, added their voice in the development of the plan? Yeah, we have. And so and that's on a few different levels. Um, as I mentioned, while we were developing the plan, we we held a lot of different community workshops and um, focus groups. And a part of those focus groups, we really made sure to bring in not, not just like business owners and hospitality partners, but also people from the nonprofit and environmental sectors as well. And so throughout the plan, there is a lot of influence from groups who have been working on a lot of these issues already. And the 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 hope, the focus, the goal of this was not to necessarily duplicate or, or step over the work already being done. It was actually to highlight it, potentially find out where there are gaps, and to be able to work together to really either fill those ga gaps or enhance the efforts already taking place. And so even with the Destination Stewardship Council, that group will have representatives from, from all sectors as well. I'm Lynn Riddick speaking with Krista Valentino of the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board. 
and we'll be back after this short break. Do you work or volunteer for the National Park Service? Are you retired from the Department of the Interior? Learn how you could earn $250 by joining Interior Federal Credit Union and opening up a new credit card. Visit their website for membership details and how to join. Federally insured by NCUA. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. I'm back now with Krista Valentino. Tell me a little bit about certification as a globally recognized sustainable destination, which is a component of the plan. There are many of these certifications that are offered around the world to destinations. And what is really important about them is that you meet and and maintain a certain level of um, criteria in order to be certified. And so sometimes they are these you know, having a sustainable destination management plan of sorts. Sometimes they are having certain types of communication or a certain number of businesses working in a certain way. There, There's a lot of different components to that. And so it is something that we have looked at and have and are interested in being a part of. But what I thought was really interesting and, and for me kind of heartwarming and makes me smile is that when we were going through the SDMP process, those, those community focus groups I was telling you about, we had presented to them a couple of, uh, a, a draft mission and vision for tourism in Teton County. And I had read it to you earlier, this idea of Teton County, Wyoming is a leader in balancing the needs and aspiration of community members, mis- businesses, and visitors, et cetera, et cetera. When we had originally presented that to the community, there was the word in there, world leader. And so Teton County, Wyoming is a world leader. And consistently across the board, people kept saying, we shouldn't have the word world leader in there because we should be doing this not because of other people, but we should be doing this because this is what's best for our community. And it doesn't, yeah, maybe we get certifications or accolades, but that shouldn't matter as much as us leading because it's what's right for here. And so I see that as, yes, getting these internationally recognized certifications are very important, right? It puts you on the map. It also creates a little bit of a checks and balances to say that this isn't just, you know, like greenwashing, but actually we are taking these steps and moving it forward. And I do think that there is a big positive with that. And I would say that what we heard, what I heard from the community is that it isn't necessarily a driver for us to do that work. So did you look at any other similar towns or similar communities uh, in the modeling of this plan? Many of them, yeah. So there are so many communities right now who have either just gone through this process or are going through it right now. Communities like Aspen, like Vail, Sedona, um, Tahoe is just starting out their process, Glacier County up in Montana. And then there's also countries and and a lot of communities and destination countries, especially in Europe, for instance. And so we really did a lot of research and even reached out to some of these communities to ask what their experience was, what they were hearing, what their challenges were, how they dealt with them. And What was fun that came out of that is in those conversations, we found that there were so many similarities. And in a a lot of instances where many people want to peg these destinations against each other, right? Like, are you going to go to Aspen or are you going to go to Jackson? Who has better snow? What we were finding is that we can learn a lot from each other and have consistently spoken since then to learn 
to troubleshoot and to potentially continue to work together into the future to develop messaging since many of our visitors are often the same type of person or even the same people. So having that consistency in messaging destination to destination really just drives the type of responsible tourism that that we want. You know, big festivals draw a lot of people and you've got the Snake River Fest, the Jackson Hole Summer Wine and Food Festival, the Jackson Hole Music Festival, Jackson Hole Marathon. Are there any thoughts on maybe limiting the number of festivals that get created further out or are you comfortable with that number of festivals and the people that it brings in or is that just sort of not really an issue that's going to be specifically addressed in the plan? Yeah, um, things like limitations and restrictions is somewhere that we aren't looking at in in implementing the plan um, and hasn't been talked about. A big reason for that is with I think there's a belief that with the correct level of management, with the correct infrastructure, with the correct communications, that there isn't necessarily a need to limit things or people or experiences. Rather, if you can plan them well and integrate them well and you have all the systems in place, that they, again, could be drivers. They can they can really support the power of tourism. They can give people an opportunity to, to, to come visit, especially maybe in times of year where there's lower visitation versus, say, like the high season. So, for instance, something that the Travel and Tourism Board does is we do fund the marketing of events, but we will not fund events that take place in the summer because summer is such a high season for us. However, we encourage local organizations and and businesses to host events in our off season and our slower times, especially over weekends, say that aren't holiday weekends. So we can try to disperse people a little bit better. So we still have maybe that same number of tourism, but we don't have everyone coming all at the same time. I was wondering, did you get a tourism blip after HBO filmed a couple of episodes of The Last of Us uh, portraying Jackson as a survivor community? <laughs> um, I had to ask you that. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, it was, it's funny. I actually uh, watched that series and was curious what that would look like when it came in. And it was, it was definitely, it was interesting to hear the, uh, hear some local resident rhetoric around their opinions of that <laughs> <laughs> I bet. but it's it's definitely where I'd want to hold up if there was a zombie apocalypse so I don't blame them <laughs> <laughs> well to summarize um, the next steps are to complete the establishment of the interim destination stewardship council and then create a permanent governance structure for destination management and SDMP implementation uh, what kind of time frame are we talking about? Yeah, um, so we've already have the Destination Stewardship Council established. So that's a big checkbox. And they're meeting and beginning to establish that those priority areas for this first year. We are in the process of creating a scope of work and a plan to begin doing data collection um, and data analysis as well. And so that should be done in the next couple of months. And part of one of the first tasks of the Destination Stewardship Council will be really to develop those, um, like, even if it's two or three priority areas that we want to work on by the end of the year. The, the big the big piece here is momentum, right? We all work really well when we have momentum behind us. And so we're trying to keep up that momentum, show these quick wins, continue to get feedback and buy-in and engagement from the community. And then as we move into especially prior or year two, um, continue to build on those priority actions, things that maybe take a little more time, a little more, more effort or some more um, facilitation. But it's all it's all laid out in their, that plan. And I think we have a really great roadmap to get us there. And, and also the energy excitement and, and commitment from the people that need to be a part of it. It's very thorough. And I would encourage anybody who's interested to take a look at the plan. How did they find it? 
Sure. So you can go to our website. It's visitjacksonhole.com. And on the nav navigation link, you can uh, click the link that is called locals. And under that page, you just scroll down and you can get the full SDMP that is 75 pages. Or next to it, you can get just the abridged highlight version, which is 12 pages. <laughs> okay. Uh, those are all the questions I had for you. Is there anything you want to add? No, I, th I think the only thing I would add is um, a big thank you to our community and to the board and our partners. So many people put an incredible amount of work into developing and delivering this plan. It's something I think we are all incredibly proud of and check back in in, in another year or so. And I could probably give you a better idea of, of how it's going, but I feel pretty positive about the direction we're headed in. Well, we will check back in. Um, Krista, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all the details of this uh, massive undertaking and a huge effort. Uh, so we'll be interested in seeing how the plan unfolds in the coming weeks and years. Yeah, well, thank you, Lynn. Thanks for having, having us on. And let me share a little bit with you. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any thoughts on how parks and gateway communities can better manage visitors in a sustainable fashion, please leave your thoughts on this week's podcast post on nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.